What I have drawn here is a graphical layout of the LAC operon. And LAC operons, or operons as a whole, essentially have two components. So an operon has what we call an operator and the structural, and gene, the structural genes. So if you remember, this operon is going to be turned on when it gets to signal to, and then it's going to produce the proteins necessary for a particular function and those would be the structural genes. The operator is going to be the part of this operon that is important to actually control whether it's turned on and off. So remember up here we're going to need to be able to turn it on or turn it off based on the environment that it's in. And the operator is going to allow that to occur. So let's kind of look at it here structurally. What I'm showing here with this particular area is the transcriptional start site. These areas here, the LAC-Z, the LAC-Y, and the LAC-A, these are the genes, or the structural genes in this operon. The P is the promoter, so this is where RNA polymerase will bind. And O is the operator, so we're going to see that this segment of DNA is going to be involved in whether this whole thing gets turned on or off. Another form of regulation that we're going to determine as a more of a positive type of regulation is this cap binding site. This is catabolic activating protein. So we're going to see somewhere else there's going to be another protein that's involved that will bind here and that's help going to control the expression of this operon. What we see over here to the left, which actually is not part of the operon itself, the operon is kind of defined by the promoter and the structural genes. Over here, though, is another gene that's involved, and it makes a protein called a repressor. And specifically, this LAC I gene creates what we call the LAC repressor. Okay, so what it's going to do is when this gene is made, it's going to produce a protein. So I'm going to draw that as a square that binds to the operator. So when it's binding, it prevents expression. So what you have to kind of envision here is when this LAC repressor is produced, it binds to the operator and is physically repressing it from making these structural genes. So what we're going to see is we need to somehow prevent that repressor from binding so we can turn on these structural genes. And this is where lactose itself comes into play. So when lactose is available, lactose will actually bind to the repressor that will then prevent it from binding to the operon or the operator here. So basically when we're up at this situation that lactose is necessary or it's the only energy source, we need to turn it on. So what's essentially happening is the repressor is normally sitting here but in the presence of lactose, it's binding to that repressor and preventing it from binding to the operator. When that happens, these structural genes can then be transcribed. Now there is another level of complexity here, because we still have to ask the question, what happens when we have both glucose and lactose? We want to keep that lactose operon off. So obviously there's another level of control here, and that's where the CAP binding site comes into play. So CAP is actually a protein that when it is made, it can only bind when stuck with, or when bound with, cyclic A and P. So we're gonna see this is a positive control factor. Whereas the repressor is preventing these structural genes from being transcribed or preventing their expression, the cat protein, when it's binding to the cat binding site, is a positive factor. It's allowing it to occur. So let me draw this as a more of a plus here. So that's where we go back over to our glucose here in cyclic AMP. So when glucose level is high, the cyclic AMP level is low. So that means the cap is not being bound with cyclic AMP, therefore it is not binding to the cap binding site, and therefore we cannot transcribe this. When the glucose level is low, the cyclic AMP level is high, 
Therefore, cyclic A and P is binding to the cap, which means it's going to bind to the cap binding site and activate it. So now we can redo things. When glucose is actually available and it's the only thing, we have no cap binding plus the repressor is binding. When lactose is there, we have cap binding and no repressor. And then when we have glucose and lactose, we have no cap and we have the repressor and no repressor actually because the lactose is binding to it and preventing it from working. So really to turn this on, turn on these structural genes, we need both the cap binding, and that's due to the cyclic A and P levels over here, and we want to prevent the repressor binding, and that's due to the lactose binding preventing it from expressing. So here you can see the beautiful elegance of the system, and the bacteria has lots of these. What we're going to see later is we can actually, in the laboratory, utilize this promoter operator function to control expressions of genes that we may desire in the lab. And I'll expound on that in another video.